All right, Kelvin. Hey, thank you for doing this. Uh, very, very kind of you to agree to do this. Obviously, I know you from uh, your CIME days. You were there as head of research and you also covered ASEAN for the bank for many, many years. That's how I know you from my days in journalism. But I understand that you've since left the bank and uh, you've also started your own company, uh, also in investment. Maybe I'll, I'll pass that on to you so you can introduce yourself and talk about what you're doing currently. Hi, right, well, glad to be on your show, uh, Chuang, and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I was in CIB for um, about 12 years, uh, left about six years ago. And thereafter, I, uh, me and my partner, ex-colleague, uh, we started up an investment company that ran for about four, four plus years until this year, um, I decided to go my own way and uh, to tie up with a asset management company in, in, in Singapore. So, so I understand you're running a, a fund called the Qualys Global Fund, right? And the, the company that you're working with currently is called R3 Asset Management. So that obviously means you don't necessarily look at Malaysia stocks. Uh, you look at overseas stocks. I guess maybe what we can do in terms of launching into the questions, Kelvin, is um, talk about the fundamentals behind how you invest, right? Your process in approaching stock selection, industry selection. I mean, the stock market is, is huge. It's massive. H- how, do you, how do you get started on the entire process? Well, I, yeah, you're right. I invest uh, mainly globally, uh, predominantly in the U.S. Um, you know, when I first started out, um, after I left CIMB, I was looking at many Malaysian companies and companies in the region. But I, you know, didn't, I didn't find that there were a lot of very interesting or very, uh, very uh, durable companies out there. So I started looking at the U.S. and there's a wealth of information out there. So in terms of, to, to get back to your question, um, yeah, I look for companies that are profitable, uh, that has got good tailwinds behind them, good growth, good runway ahead of them, and they are uh, companies that are not sensitive to the, uh, to the economy or to the economic cycle, such that if any sort of um, headwinds or any sort of economic turbulence that comes along, you know, you can still sleep well at night. Is that even... Is that even possible in terms of um, having a company which is impervious to all the shocks in the economy and, and what have you? Yeah, I won't say they're entirely impervious, but if you look at um, the recent uh, pandemic, you know, the, the pandemic that we're going through and what happened last year, if you look at like some of the big companies like Microsoft, for example, you know, they, they did very well. You know, they it didn't look as if they were even impacted. In fact, they benefited from it. And there are a lot of other similar companies, uh, software companies uh, or e-commerce companies uh, who benefited from it. So there are enough companies out there um, that are pretty much um, immune to whatever economic shocks. I wouldn't say immune, immune is a strong word, but pretty uh, insulated from any sort of economic shock. Yeah, so Kevin, I'm, the thing is for, for, for people who are newbies, right? Um, just trying to try understand the process behind a very experienced fund manager like yourself because yes you understand you know Microsoft has been around a long time right but it is a very big company it's worth over a trillion US dollars now so the growth is what it wouldn't I wouldn't say it's kept on the upside but you know it's going to be very difficult to get a two trillion three trillion four trillion right you want to ideally choose Microsoft you know 40 years ago right uh, you want to choose, like, for example, C Limited, the the, the Southeast Asian uh, Amazon, like maybe four years ago when it was like trading at, I don't know, five, ten bucks Singapore dollars or something. Then it goes to like, you know, 20, 30 times that, right? What is your process in terms of looking for the next Amazon, the next Microsoft? How do you find these names? Um, okay, well, firstly, uh, Microsoft is now two trillion. Um, and... <laughs> two trillion. <laughs> <laughs> two trillion, not one trillion. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay about stocks uh, growing. You know, they don't have to like sell or they don't have to like go tenfold in, in, in two years or whatever, you know. I'm happy with uh, investing in something that gives me 10, 20, 30% a year. Um, that, that is itself and you can do it in a very consistent and uh, very secure way. Uh, that works for me as well. But to your question, what do I, where do I look, how do I look for companies that are going to do well. I think you can see in this space, you've got to look in the right space, right? So e-commerce, for example, um, since we were, we're on the topic, uh, that is still a very uh, an, an economy in the in infancy. Uh, the sector that's still got long way, a long runway to go. 
Um, for example, we can talk about um, Etsy, right? That's a company that uh, recently I was looking into, and that's still uh, fairly small in the overall scheme of things. Uh, C, as you mentioned, or Mercado Libre, they've still got plenty of runway in where they operate in, and you can you can take a five or ten year view. They'll be a multi baggers. So at Etsy is ETSY. It used to have little curios and little collectors put all the you know their personal collections on. So that was very small and quite quaint in those days. I, I presume it's bigger now. And then you 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 mentioned Mercado Libre. That's is that South American? And then C Limited is of of course it's Singapore, right? Which owns I think Shopee, right? That's right. That's right. So so Mercado Libre is the equivalent in in the Latin America. Uh, they've got uh, they've got a fintech. Um, um, Equivalent is they've got fintech operation as well, uh, so it's like a C limited but in a different geography. Yeah, so I I guess then for someone like you, you fall back on your experience as a fund manager, right? You you have a feel of the market. So for example, you would feel that maybe it's not the right time to put money into oil and gas or energy stocks today because maybe for whatever reasons, right? You would put money into e-commerce, which is as a bigger growth runway. How much of your selection and your feel of the market comes from your experience, and how much of that comes from in terms of trying to forecast based on news flow and and trend flow? Well, firstly, um, I stick to a, a set rule, um, and like I mentioned earlier, I don't invest in companies that are very that are exposed to the the vagaries of the economy, the cycles of the economy. So, oil and gas, commodities. Banks and so on, even even airlines. Something I wouldn't I wouldn't go near. Um, you know, you don't know when it's going to be a downturn. So uh, I stick to companies which I see which has got a more a straighter line, if you may. You know, in terms of the growth, uh, and if you can project it outwards. Whereas if you look at the commodities and so on, they tend to be more more wavy along the way, and, and I can't sleep well at night uh, investing in those kind of uh, stocks. So definitely less cyclical. Um which would also be rules out property stocks and, and what have you, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, and, and what about um, stock, well, or rather portfolio monitoring? How actively are you watching it? What kind of um, data do you look at to, to tell yourself, I should add more, more money to this stock or I should reduce uh, my position in the stock? How, how do you approach that? Um, okay, then to add more, if... I would add more if the companies that I buy uh, comes down in price. That means I have got the I need to have the conviction um, to to be able to buy when it comes down. And generally, the um, you know the the human instinct is that if it drops, you know you 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 panic and you might want to just toss out the stock, right? But why sell it when it's selling for cheaper right now? Uh, in fact, you're looking to buy it. Right? It's just like you buy a, a shoe comes on sale. Or twenty percent off, that makes it more attractive. So when I buy a uh, stock, I need to have the conviction, um, and that such that if the share price falls, I wouldn't panic and I would look to accumulate further. And you you do get this sort of opportunities uh, through the year. In any year, you do get you know sell offs that can come up between five to ten percent. That's very normal. Um, and last year was an exceptional year. But this year alone, we saw that happening in, in March, I think when the taper tantrum uh, started to take over the, the market. And there was an opportunity to buy. And even back in uh, May, there was another round, a smaller round. And that also was an opportunity to, to, to go in. So just for the benefit of people who don't understand what a taper tantrum is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Calvin, but I think it's the whole um, perceived end to this era of low interest rates and the Federal Reserve, which is the uh, American Reserve Bank, which is like Bank Nagara equivalent, right? Um, they will start to raise interest rates, which therefore presumably is bad for the market, right? Um, just, just a quick opinion from you, Calvin. Um, what is your approach to this whole taper tantrum and this whole rate tightening cycle where interest rates go up and, and this whole liquidity, this cheap money era is over? Well, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a um, crystal ball gazing as to when you think um, the, the interest rates are, and inflation rather is going to go up. Um, I don't spend too much time thinking about that. Um, although in the back of your mind, you, it sort of helps you sort of decide when uh, the sort of certain stock of certain sectors uh, will come into favor again. 
because um, earlier in the when things were opening up, economies were opening up, the cyclical stocks were, were in play <coughs> and the growth and <coughs> excuse me, the quality names were, were out of favor simply because there were concerns that uh, interest rates were, were starting to rise. So this sort of presents the opportunity. Um, aside from that, I spend more time looking at the fundamentals of the companies. Um, yes, eventually um, interest rates will rise, but um, you know you would think that I would expect that the companies that I invest are able to withstand um, the, the higher costs that are involved and will be able to, will be able to pass on uh, the cost to the consumers. Okay, that makes so the fundamental sense. will sorry. So that, that makes a lot of sense. If you're a good company, obviously you can pass on the higher costs. Yeah, exactly. So you look for companies that have good pricing power um, and uh, you know, eventually the fund- their fundamentals will prevail. In a short term, they'll probably go through some sort of turbulence, but you, know, you shouldn't be too shaken by that. In fact, you should be looking at that as an opportunity to, to get in. So the assumption here is that you've chosen the right name and you've gotten it right from the get-go, right? But what happens when you don't necessarily choose the right name? You know, it's a bit of a bet. It's a bit of a risk, right? That's the first thing. Second thing is, how do you monitor developments? Do you look at the, the exchange filings? And if you if you do, like, for example, in, in South America, how do you look at the exchange filings? How, do you get access to it as a customer? So I, I know you have to pay in certain countries. I think in the UK, you've got to pay for it. And then there's also language issues. You know, so so things like that, right? If when you don't get it right the first time, how do you address it? And then just in terms of monitoring flow, do you read the Wall Street Journal? Do you read the exchange flaw filings? Do you look at the Financial Times? How do you do that? Sure. So in term, in terms of like, I don't go invest in companies in uh, South America as in listed in South America. Mercado Libre, for example, uh, is listed in the U.S. So the filings are all uh, in in the U.S and the requirements and the quality and the standard and the transparency that's required by the US SEC, uh, which I think is superior to you know, most of the Latin American exchanges. Uh, so that gives, itself, um, that gives you a better transparency than uh, most other jurisdictions. Um, as to what I refer to, you know, the, I look at the uh, filings, yes, uh, news that comes out, um, the usual, um, the usual news portals out there. Um, but just to, to circle back to your original question, what if I uh, choose to pick the wrong stock? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're humans, I'm not going to deny that we made a mistake. But you minimize that by uh, making sure that the company that you're going, you're investing is, uh, is a good one, as in it's, it's got very strong moats, if I can use uh, Warren Buffett's uh, terminology. And once you've got that established and, come, and, and, and also they need to have a, a good track record, right? So usually I tend to avoid the IPOs because a lot of these companies and, uh, tend to have very short uh, time history. Uh, the specs especially, you know, to me, the specs are speculative. Uh, most of them, so I stay clear away, uh, from that. But if you look at the, there are lots of companies that have got good track record and track record is important because it shows you that over the years, they've been a little perform consistently. Um, so with that, you, it gives you a high level of confidence, right, um, to, to invest in a company. And the mistake may come in the sense that you buy it at a too high a price, right? And it happens all the time. But if that happens, then if the share price comes down, buy some more, right? And you know that uh, over time, uh, the fundamentals uh, will prevail and the share price uh, re- will reflect the fundamentals. So Warren Buffett says that you know, time is the, uh, is the best friend of the good companies. Yeah, so so does that mean you might stay? I mean, for example, if you if you miss out on the Alibaba, so like for example, and financial, right? Uh, when when and if it ever comes out again, um, does that mean you, you avoid it? Uh, Didi Chu Sing, for example, from China as well, coming out, would you avoid it? Um, you know, because it's it's proven. It comes from the, the same guys that brought you Alibaba. Yeah, so Alibaba, for example, yeah, we, you know, um, I, I wrote it all the way down um, because of the because of what happened with Ant. Uh, it's sort of bottomed out. It's recovered, but you know, um, it's a company that is still very very solid and something that I'm not going to toss it out. Um, Didi Chu Sing, I th- there are lots of other tech companies in China. 
Um, I tend to, I don't tend to look at China that closely, um, largely because perhaps of um, the, the, cult, the, the language um, the, and also the, um, the sort of news flow that comes out of China. It's, well, I don't speak, I don't read Chinese. Um, so I, I stick to where I know. Um, and there's plenty out there in the, in the Western world that I can, I, that's, that's available to invest in. Yeah, then just, I, I guess, almost lastly on portfolio management, do you have a maximum number of names that you hold so that you can, you know, look at them adequately? Um, and, and, you know, what is your process behind just portfolio management? Yeah, so I, I tend to hold about 20 to 25 names. Uh, I don't want to hold anything more um, because that way you, end up, you might end up putting in companies that are uh, inferior or less, uh, less attractive in them in terms of their qualities. Uh, anything less also may mean that you may not get the kind of diversification that, you, that we're after. So I think um, you know, over the years, I feel that 20, 25 names is a, is a good number. And it allows you to track them uh, quite closely. And um, in terms of portfolio management, I'm always on the lookout for uh, names that I can put in and names that I can take out of the portfolio. So let's say if a certain stock has run very hard and, and uh, I think it may, may, have, uh, may be a bit overvalued and I find a name that I like a lot and the share price has come off, so I might sell that out and put a new new name in there. Yeah, but yeah. I generally don't trade much. Yeah. So obviously investing is a very, um, it's a cerebral process, right? Uh, and, and I remember this um, this newsletter that, I think was it CLSA or something, the the, the, the investment bank, they used to put out a, a newsletter called um, Fear and Greed, right? Uh, fear and greed are the only two emotions which rule markets. Obviously, greed and fear. Fear is when you sell your stocks. Greed is when you buy more stocks. Um, what what is is there a is there a mental process behind how you approach investing, Kelvin? Uh, can you distill it to a science? How what is your headspace when you look at the investment markets? I think the science comes from uh, the fundamentals, as in there are numbers. You know, if you look at the the financial statements, the ROEs, the, uh, the profitability, the margins, the trends of these numbers, um, how they compare with uh, their peers, that you can call that a, a science, right? It's more exact, you can see the numbers. But it's also an art in the sense that um, the, after all, human emotions and market emotions are, are, are more unpredict uh, is a bit unpredictable. So it's also a bit of an art to to decipher all this. And um, I think it also boils down to a bit of experience, but a bit over time, you know, you pay some tuition fees and all your losses, you tend to, you, you sort of get the idea, you sort of get the way you want. Yeah, and there's also this whole unknown element about, you know, for example, uh, financial fraud and individuals going a bit awry. Um, there's been examples through the years, I think in a local context, you can cite Silver Dynamic, for example, although alleged and not yet proven, um, but it's the people behind the company, right? How, I mean, when you sit from afar, three, 4,000 miles away uh, across two oceans, right? How do you factor in the possibility that they might just, you know, go a bit funny in the head? Yeah, I think uh, this also boils down to what I uh, say earlier in the show, where you want to look at companies that have got good uh, track record, good operating history, and, uh, and the companies that have got a long track record is unlikely to go and go astray on you. Um, you know, uh, so in that sense, it provides you with a lot of uh, a lot more sense of comfort. And the other thing about investing in in China and more developed markets, yeah, they, they tend to run higher risks of that happening. I won't deny that. I wouldn't say that in, in the developed markets, it doesn't happen. But I think the, the risk of that is lower, especially for companies that have got, you know, much, much uh, better track record, much longer track record. Yeah. And, and, uh, and of course, the, the one big thing that has become very obvious in the last few years is this whole idea of uh, black swan events, right? This idea that was made famous by this guy called uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, uh, what, 10 years ago when he wrote the book. Um, you know, obviously SARS, uh, COVID, uh, terrorism, this whole idea that the Southeast, the South China Sea might be um, a potential, you know, center of conflict in the future. 
Um, how do you iron out these volatilities, you know, as an investor? Especially if you're, you know, if you don't have a lot of like savings, you know, if like, like a small retail investor, right? And you're trying to make some money better than FD, um, but then you've also got this whole thing that anything can happen, right? How do you iron those volatilities out? Um, well, the volatility is is part of the market and you either have to, you, you, you have to embrace it and actually um, try to take advantage of that. Uh, so a black swan event was what? Was one, uh, one black swan event was what happened last year. With of course, COVID, yeah, right. Yeah. And actually, um, I saw that coming. The, you know, the, the, uh, the cases were, were going up. I think the market was, um, was in denial for a while. Um, but if you buy good companies, they're able to ride it out. Um, you know, it's just that the human emotion, I think most people may not be, uh, may not have the kind of discipline uh, to ride it out. You see that yeah, the investments fall by, you know, 30, 40, even 50%. Um, but if you have the conviction that the companies that you own are solid, are they able to be able to benefit or be able to recover from this? Uh, they've got to have strong balance sheets. Uh, then it will it will sort itself out. Uh, you have to be forward looking, and you got to ask yourself, you know, uh, how long is this going to last? Um, so in the case of the pandemic, you are, I told myself that look, a year out, things are going to be much better. You got to trust science that. Um, they'll be able to bring. They'll be able to bring in the med, uh, the vaccines and the um, and med- medicines to to tackle this. And um, you know, a year plus from uh, from that event, I think we are in a much better better position, and we have had a we've had a good uh, run since. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, with names like Apple and I think uh, Amazon and Tesla had one of the biggest best years last year, and I think when Mark. Markets collapsed in March. It was one of the best opportunities to buy. Um, how much cash do you hold? I mean, as a, as a principal, you know, so that you got more bullets in, in your armory when, when the uncertain events happen. How much cash do you hold at any one point in time so that you can go back in and, and add to your position? Anyways, uh, between um, 0 and 10% of the portfolio. Okay, okay. So so is, is that considered normal? Is that considered under under cash because when you have cash it doesn't yield anything right obviously uh yeah exactly right so you got to balance that um so it's also a bit of a gut view where you think that okay the market is running a bit hot and you may want to pair back a little bit but generally i don't try to time the market so um at the same time i i i don't try to hold uh, that much cash either just want to put them to work and if you take a long-term view you know five years four five years out um, you know, this cash is not going to do much for you. Yeah. Um, so might as well just you know leave it in there and make make the money work for you. Yeah. So I guess just from the tone of your replies and what you're saying, um, you wouldn't be touching things like Ethereum. You wouldn't be touching uh <laughs> non fungible uh tokens. You wouldn't be touching things like even specs. Clearly, right? Uh, is is that would it would that be right to say? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's. Yeah. I think that's um. I suspect a lot of that is uh, running on the greater fool theory. You, know, you buy something hoping that somebody will buy at a higher price than you without any change in fundamentals. The greater fool theory. Understood by many, but not uh, not practiced by a lot. Um, then what about things like new emerging themes like say, you know, uh, ESG investing, uh, social impact investing. That seems to be coming up in a big way. Even the banks are adhering to these things and, and ratings are based upon how you know, responsible you are as a corporate citizen. What about things like that? Is is there is there a return in, in any of that? Um, there probably is, but I don't spend too much time thinking about that. Um, you know, the the um, like for example, I I stay out of a lot of these um, sectors that are under the scrutiny of ESG, like for example, like plantations, oil and gas. Things are a bit more destructive to the environment. Um, so it's not something that I, I look at. Um, how you know? However, you look at companies like Amazon. They're talking about uh, trying to be carbon neutral uh, by a certain date. Uh, they want to have um, green energy power their servers uh, over a certain time. So you know the companies I invest in, I think generally have got uh, good ESG uh, qualities in them. 
Okay, and and I guess with with something like China, right? Obviously, there's a parallel universe in China with big tech, um, uh, what they famously call ATM, right? Alibaba, Tencent, and uh, Meituan, Meituan, Jianping. Um, so you don't really look at China as as a general rule. Um, should investors look at China if they can speak Mandarin, if they can stomach the volatility and and the you know the vagaries of the Chinese government? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know, it's um, it's a market which. If it's something that you enjoy looking at, and you've got, uh, you have got, uh, you're able to uh, understand what's going on in China by all means, um, you know, um, that's to me. I still feel that I don't have that kind of edge uh, looking at China. I I don't speak the language. I don't follow any sort of Chinese media or movies. So it's something that's a lot more foreign to me, and it's more difficult for me to appreciate. Yeah, so for you, long term sustainable returns, comfortable growth, um, sleep at night, very important, right? <laughs> Peace of mind. Um, that's right, right? Um, and then personally, right, Kelvin? Um, obviously, you've also got your own savings, and h- how do you personally invest your own money? Um, similar to what I've described, um, you know, I've got my my own money in the fund that I manage, uh, and basically, I you know, you need to have a, your own skill in, in the game. And I, and especially when you're investing your own money, you know, uh, you don't want to be, you don't want to lose that. And therefore you tend to be a bit more conservative. You tend to be a bit more uh, discerning in terms of what you invest in, right? And, um, and there's, you know, there's so much hype over new things like NFTs and Bitcoins, but I think it's hype. And I think uh, it's something that I would just, you don't see my, I don't put my money in those things. So personally, I mean, obviously, you've got a portion in the share market, right? Whether it's local or, or, or overseas in, the, in America. What about things like, um, what, what is your point of view on things like real estate or, or property or, um, you know, th- 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 things like that, right? Your, your conventional asset classes, you know, fixed income assets or bonds, for example, for an income. Yeah, I used to invest in uh, real estate, um, but I have basically sold out uh, most of them. Um, I find that um, stocks provide you with far superior returns um, in the sense that there are a lot of good companies out there that you you can identify and they can grow over time with you. Whereas the real estate, uh, it depends on the underlying underlying fundamentals of the economy. Um, So take, for example, in Malaysia, I don't see real estate going anywhere. But uh, in the US, I suppose that's a a different story. But I think, um, you know, over over the years, I find that stocks um, now appeals to me far more. Uh, Apart from the fundamentals, I think the cost of going in and out is uh, far less. And you don't have to deal with uh, issues of, you know, tenants and, um, you know, having to fix a leak here and there. You know, where's the stock? It's, you just buy, you click on it, and then uh, it, it behaves itself. <laughs> Hopefully, touch wood, uh, if you choose the right name. Um, you know, of course, when you try and sell a property, it takes a long time, six months, 12 months, depending, right? That's a long, long, it's not liquid. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a last question for you, Kelvin, and it's, it's a very practical question, right? So if you're like a, a small retail mom and pop investor in, in Malaysia that does buy stocks in, 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 say, the US, right? You would use one of the, lo- the local banks, right? Um, but then the local banks take, really take their pound of flesh. Like, for example, when, when dividend payments come in, then there's two or three layers of intermediary costs. And then, you know, your, your return at the end of the day is, is tiny, right? How how do the professional investors do to to iron out those you know those uh, high costs of uh, intermediaries whereby you don't you don't pay so much agency fees and you know stamp du- you know those duty fees and things like that. Um, I'm not okay to be honest. I'm not aware of how much uh, the agency fees uh, add up. All right. Um, I have never really, I've never that never really caught my eye. Um, I have invested, I do have a, a bit of REITs invested and I used to have more. Um, that was really never an, an issue for me. Um, and I don't know if it's a Malaysian uh, Malaysian phenomenon, but I, that was something that I, I never, never caught my eye. 
All right, man, Kelvin, it was a really good, um, you know, uh, good experience talking to you. Um, very enlightening. Um, hope you know people uh, have have lots to learn from from what you say, and uh, good luck with the with the process going forward, man. Um, hope you make Thank lots you. of money this year as much as you did right. last year. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so.